Hi, uh, I'm Catherine, female fed up with on Twitter and my blog is female fed up with feminism. Um, five years after I started doing this, here I am finally making my first YouTube video. Um, one day I will hopefully make a YouTube video explaining why it has taken me so long. Um, part of that reason has been just how frightening it is to speak out and just how the other side um, will go to such great lengths to silence people. Um, so I've kind of decided it was the Lindsay Shepherd incident that really has just made me think, right, enough is enough. I have to be brave. She is a lot younger than me. She's 22 years old. Um, she's a teaching assistant. She's risked her job. She's risked her, her master's degree. She's risked everything um, to take this chance. So I'm going to try and follow her example and also the example of people like James Damore, um, and also people like um, lesser known people, um, Josh, Josh O'Brien particularly is someone um, that has really inspired me. He's so young, he's got his whole life, his whole career ahead of him. Um, and he's really, he's really taking a risk on that and he's really um, sticking his neck out. And it's important that we all speak up and that we all are brave because the more of us who do stand up and fight against these issues at the end of the day, um, the harder it's going to be for them to slander us and for them to come after us. Um, and, you know, try and portray us as people, you know, try and associate us as, as you know, happened in the Lindsay Shepherd interview. They, they tried to pretty much associate her with every horrible thing you could, they could think of from climate change denial to the tobacco industry to Hitler, obviously. Um, so it's time for me to um, get my face out there and hopefully um, stop being afraid. And uh, as Jordan Peterson talks about, you know, you're, you're more free it's better for you when you have spoken up because you can, you know, these people haven't made you into a, a coward. And that's what I've really hated um, about how these people try to silence you. They make you afraid. Um, and I kind of really resent that. So it's time to start speaking out. The um, people interviewing Lindsay Shepherd make it very clear that the problem is not that she played the tape. She says, I was neutral. I was professional. I didn't take a side. And they tell her, well, that's the problem. Um, and they're really trying to size up how much she fits into their ideology. They keep trying to figure out what's in her mind. They keep saying, are you sorry that you said that? Do you acknowledge this? Do you acknowledge that you might have upset someone? It's, re it's not about the effect that she had necessarily. It's about, does this girl agree with us? Or does this girl dare to depart from our narrative? Dr. Rambakana tells Lindsay Shepherd that she shouldn't have presented these this debate in a balanced way to these students because they're too young. She then says, hang on a minute, they're 18, they're adults, aren't they? And what does he say? No, no, they're very young adults. They're not ready to have both sides presented equally. Um, as if that isn't bad enough, Dr. Pimlock then steps in and um, the speech that Dr. Pimlock makes is just, again, it has to be either heard or read to be believed. This man is supposed to be a professor of communication studies he ends up making the most rambling incoherent speech I ended up having to transcribe it because I found it in impossible to quote from this speech when I was trying to quote him in an article that I wrote about this topic um, it's completely unfocused on the subject he brings he talks about conspiracy theories he talks about the tobacco lobby he talks about climate change denial he brings in all these political opinions it has nothing to do with trans pronouns it has nothing to do with the issue at hand and it just shows how he's just got this spiel going round and round in his head about how he thinks the world works and it is this speech is literally the to sum it up he is saying students come to this university to come to this university with a very strong opinions about X, Y, and Z. And he's basically saying, it takes me up to two years to deprogram these people. You know, he doesn't want them to view the world in a balanced way. He wants them to completely agree with him and what he thinks about the world. Um, so one of the things he says is, um, I don't feel I'm teaching critical engagement in a world where all the establishment dominant institutions in society reinforce a number of different types of privileges, perspectives and prejudices, where the university is one of the few places where we can actually take people and engage them and challenge them and challenge their faith based family and other types of structures in society they've been inculcated with for years. 
Um, so basically he's saying society has brainwashed these people and we have to de-brainwash them, which the hypocrisy in that is just unbelievable. Um, and I think it really is an example of, well, when I was at school, we used to have a rhyme that went twinkle, twinkle, little star. What you say is what you are. Uh, I don't know if anyone else sung that rhyme at school or if it was just me. I don't know. Um, but there's also Sargon's Law, which is, you know, every time um, an ideologue like this makes a, some kind of judgment about how society works and how the world works, they're actually making that judgment about themselves. Um, and I think that's really what is going on here, just that the hypocrisy is through the roof of I have to deprogram these kids and, and teach them how to think because society has already brainwashed them. It's just, you know, these people need to look in a mirror if they want to see where the real problem is. Um, and the other thing is, you know, these, uh, Dr. Pimlot and Dr. Rambakana, these people, they talk as if they have the right to distinguish, you know, what's, what's correct, what's reality from everything that's wrong and everything that is not reality. They say that, you know, only they, only their point of view is backed up with evidence. They say that, you know, anything that Jordan Peterson says is not backed up with evidence. And that's, of course, you know, this man, Jordan Peterson is a tenured professor. If what, how, how could he not have been subject to peer review? They keep talking about peer review, um, as if, as if every single thing he had, he would have said on the talk show had to be peer reviewed. Otherwise it can't be listened to, which is just, it's, it's just a frankly bizarre way of dismissing someone. Um, you know, one of, uh, one of Lindsay Shepard's tweet says you know someone someone's calling her all these names and she says well you know is that a peer-reviewed opinion um you know these these um social justice ideologies they say that people's life experiences and pe people's lived experiences uh sorry they are the truth and they have to be listened to and they have to be believed well they're not peer-reviewed they're not backed up with evidence but of course when it's an opinion that that supports the way that they think the world works then of course that is acceptable and it doesn't need to be peer reviewed and it doesn't need to be backed up with evidence. The opinion is the evidence when it's convenient for them. Um, but these two men who, who think they have the right and they think who think they have some kind of mandate to determine and deem what is reality, um, a legal expert has actually shredded their argument that Lindsay Shepard may have actually violated Bill C-16. Um, I'll put a link to it in the low bar. He's just saying these two men don't even know what they're talking about, and yet they are in a position of power at this university, and they are in a position where they can tell young people what they are and aren't supposed to think. And they are creating this environment where, you know, people have to agree with them, even though they don't know what they're talking about. They're just people. And I think it really comes down to, you know, there's a group of people who are trying to, to give themselves the right to determine what is and isn't allowed to be, you know, considered acceptable to think, to say, to write, to publish. But, you know, who are we putting in charge of that? We really need to think about that. And that's, you know, part of this fight is to really, you know, stop these people from you know, getting into legislation, getting into policy, taking over ed uh, education, and, and also, you know, the publishing of academic journals, because that really, that writes the narrative. Um, one day I need to make a video about Gamergate and about how there are academics sitting there writing this narrative, and whatever the reality is, whatever the truth was, they're the ones that are getting published in these journals, they're the ones that, you know, when history looks back, they're, they're the ones that are going to shape this narrative. And, and we really need to fight what's going on in universities because at the end of the day, whatever the truth is or was, the people that, that write the narrative about this, they're the ones that are going to control the story. They're the ones that are going to control how history remembers this. And these people are so completely unself-aware is, is the only word that I can kind of use for it. They actually say people like Jordan Peterson go into research knowing what the result will be and that therefore their research isn't valid because they've already predicted the results. And these are people who make it so clear that they are not open to any other point of view. 
they're not open to any other interpretation of how the world works. Do you think after, I mean, if, if you have gone off and listened to this uh, recording, do you think that these people had a research project that kind of showed that they might be wrong? I mean, how, how would they deal with that? Are these people cr capable of creating balanced academic work? I don't think anyone can listen to how they behaved on this recording and conclude that they are. The other thing that this recording really demonstrates is how the left wing uses this tactic of labelling anyone who disagrees with them as either alt-right or far-right or a Nazi. They do this to Jordan Peterson. They claim to follow what Jordan Peterson does and what he says, which, I mean, in reality, anyone who watches his videos for more than five minutes will know that he identifies as a classic liberal, and he actually warns about the dangers of the far right and how this, you know, the, the behaviour of the modern left, the, the intersectional social, social justice left, is actually causing really horrible, really dangerous far right groups to, you know, to be incentivised. And he's warning against that. And yet these people are just turning his message around and really kind of absolutely not, it's not a distortion, it's, it's an outright lie about what he's saying. Um, and they're doing that in order to, to create a stigma around him and to make people afraid to listen to him, to, to make people afraid to say that he inspires them or that they agree with some of his ideas. So probably one of the reasons they actually don't like Jordan Peterson is because he is actually honest about the effect of their ideology and where it's leading us. These people, they really don't want to hear that their outrageous and extremist behaviour created Donald Trump, created the rise of this right wing, this kind of, it's, it's an answer to their own identity politics. And I think they just don't want to hear it because when, when they see the result of all of this crazy ideological screeching and when they see the result is that the other side is is being sucked into this horrible divisive identity politics they just don't want to confront that they've created that situation they're the ones that started this horrible game of of pitting all these demographics against each other and i think they are just in such deep denial of what they are doing to tear society apart They've got to double down on their message and the only way to do that is not to listen to what their critics are saying because the criticism is too deep and is too cutting. They've just got to silence their opposition um, and, and attach that stigma to them so that nobody else will listen to what their opposition has to say because if pe when people do listen, this fragile structure, this fragile notion that they have, that the West, that the modern West, that a country like Canada is some kind of dystopian, oppressive nightmare, it's gonna, it's gonna crumble because it's not reality, or at least you cannot say that there is no other version of reality, that there's no other interpretation of, of reality possible, uh, when these people literally think that Canada is is a, a right-wing nightmare. The last thing I want to talk about are the people or the person who complained about Lindsay Shepard's playing of the tape in her lecture and also the people who are now protesting at Laurie University saying that the space is not safe for them and that they were triggered and they feel that they are no longer kind of welcome in the environment just because the opposite view has been aired. I do actually believe that these people have an intense emotional response to these kind of ideas being aired in their lecture. And I do believe that they feel unsafe, but this is not to do with pronouns. This is to do with the fact that their worldview was challenged, that, that someone came into their bubble where they felt that you know, their views are unquestionable and correct and everyone who disagrees with them is a horrible Nazi. These people get offended because somebody has dared to suggest that the framework that they have built up in their mind isn't the only framework and that it is questionable. 
and that actually the foundations of everything they think and everything they believe, actually someone has dared to suggest that they might be wrong. And I do believe they are deeply offended, but not about pronouns. Um, I do remember a story about how a maths lecturer was trying to teach the difference between correlation and causation. And he used this example that you can actually correlate ice cream sales to instance of rape and how, yes, there's a correlation there, but it's obviously not a causation. Several students got up and walked out of the lecture. The reason they did that wasn't because they were triggered um, about any memories of sexual assault. The reason they did that was because one of their sacred cow issues had been raised on terms that were not their own terms. Somebody was talking about rape and sexual assault in a way that wasn't completely within the framework of their own ideology. And they just can't handle that. They can't. And they, they're also prepared by other, other people within you know, academia and, and by the two doctors that, that you hear talking in the Lindsay Shepherd recording. These are two of the individuals that prime these young uh, rebels without a cause. They prime them to be super sensitive when it comes to these issues. So that yes, when someone comes and comes along and starts talking about them outside of the way that, that Dr. Pindot and Dr. Rambakana will have been talking about these issues, these young people are ready to get really upset and walk out and start getting outraged and think, oh my goodness, suddenly I've got proof that because somebody disagrees with me, they are obviously a misogynist, heteropatriarchal, Nazi who has to be protested and who has to be erased and I think that's the outrage that has been primed by by these members of the academy. Finally I just want to make the point that if this had been a situation where a softly spoken left-leaning young woman had been treated in the same way by right-leaning academics who were both male um, this story would be front page news across the western world. It was picked up by the media but it just wasn't picked up anywhere near the scale that it would have been if the situations had been reversed. And I think the reason for that is because many, not all of course, of the most influential news outlets are themselves guilty of the same biases shown by the staff of Laurel University. Um, so I think everyone needs to listen to this recording and everyone needs to talk about why these people feel just so entitled to unilaterally declare what can and cannot be thought and expressed. Um, so that was my first ever YouTube video. Uh, please let me know uh, what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, please comment, leave your thoughts. Uh, please subscribe to my channel and like my video. Follow me on Twitter. I'm female fed up with. Follow my blog. I'm female fed up with feminism. And I will hopefully be making some more videos soon. Bye bye.